Hello, everybody. I'm Julia Diana Hassan Robertson, and I'm here with Miriam Ben Shalom. If you can sign up for the Army, this is the lesbian Shiro that you have to thank for that. Um, so let's start there. Hi, how's it going? Uh, it's fine, fine. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Just a lot of gardening. So, um, talk to me about Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Well, Don't Ask, Don't Tell is was just a continuation of um, segregation in the United States. Uh, when, when it was no longer possible to foist that sort of thing on black people, well, they had to find somebody else and it was us. Um, don't Ask, Don't Tell was very draconian because basically what it was is if I served with you, you know, and, and soldiers do talk in barracks, okay? You know, what are you going to do this weekend or whatever? I would be forced to lie because right. if I to say what I am, then I would be subject to disciplinary action. I was not discharged under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I was discharged under the ban, okay? Mm -hmm. And so pretty much it was up to commanders, you know, like if somebody said, you know, oh, hey, Miriam was seen going into a gay bar, you know, it's, it was up to the commander um, whether he would institute an investigation and call me in. Um, it, it was a really, President Clinton did not do well with Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I, I remember it well, and I remember, you know, the impact of it. What was it like to have to go up against something like that? Well, it was kind of frightening at first because they wanted me to undergo a psychiatric evaluation, but I was not ordered. And I, my response to that was, is I'm, I'm a lesbian. I'm not mentally ill. Okay. Right. Uh, I was hauled in front of my commander who asked me, you know, Sarge Bench Loam, are you a uh, homosexual? And I, I said, well, sir, actually I'm a lesbian, but I know what you mean. I think what was even more frightening was when I first won and actually got to go back in, that my life was threatened. And I went to my commanding officer and said, look, I fought to get my job back. I didn't fight to sashay down the main drag of a military base wearing lavender fatigues. Right. I am getting my life threatened. People are calling me. If they want to rock and roll, let's do it. But let's do it in the open. They don't need to be cowards and call me anonymously. Right. You tell them that. Anywhere, any place, anytime, one-on-one. -on -one. And um, it stopped. And um, I actually did very well when I went back in. I... Uh, got a commendation, I got a promotion, and I had uh, expert uh, efficiency reports. And I was a, a DSL, it's a drill sergeant leader. I taught at a leadership academy, and it's interesting to note that when I lost the second time around, um, the head of the leadership academy actually went to the Pentagon and asked if I could remain in, because he said I was his best instructor, which right. I thought was a pretty big compliment. That's a huge compliment. And, you know, you, you are very much so the epitome of, of a warrior and what we think of when we think of lesbian warriors, um, just going up against the patriarchy and, and flipping it off really nice. Um, you certainly weren't going to let people tell you how to live your life. No. And you weren't going to just take what was handed to you and say, okay, well, this is how things are. I, I'd like people to know, and I'm, many people do know, that you are the one who got the ball rolling on this, and the reason we don't have Don't Ask, Don't Tell anymore, it was kicked off by, by you. And um, that's certainly something to be very proud of. Was there anyone that you worked with at the time on this, or were you just kind of going it alone? It was me, one each, and, and my attorney, one each, against the Justice Department and all of their, their, their attorneys and the J Corps. It's interesting to note that one of the attorneys that was my, on my opposition was the wonderful, chinless uh, Marvel Kenneth Starr. Know the name? Yes. Yeah, he, he was cashiered out of his university for nefarious skullduggery. Um, it, 
it was frightening simply because after it went, it got a lot of press. And so as a result, the, the Nazis got into the act because I'm Jewish and I did go on some speaking engagements. I, I was shot at. I had somebody try to wow. kill me with an ice pick. Um, yes. I lost custody of my daughter and didn't see her for three years. It, oh, wow. I, times were tough, you know, but the yeah. thing is, is that I didn't need anybody to validate me because I know full well who and what I am. And so I was able to get through it pretty much with the help of a couple of friends and guts. Yeah. Times were so different. The laws were so different. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that, the laws at the time and how that might have impacted you, how you viewed yourself or maybe your perception of other gay and lesbian people. I simply could not understand why there were laws prohibiting homosexuality. Let's leave it like that, okay? It isn't as if I chose to be a lesbian. Um, there's, I tried very hard to be what my parents wanted me to be um, and married and had a child and it didn't work. But back in 1965, 1966, 1967, we didn't have a vocabulary for what I was, okay? Right. Many people, and this is no, no insult, many people your age don't realize how it was. Yeah. I wondered what I was, went and looked up the word in, 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 in the library, and it said, you know, sexual deviant pervert. And I went, well, that's not what I am. Wow. Um, there wasn't a vocabulary. And so I, I, yeah, I thought, okay, I'll do what my parents want me to do. Yeah. Um, when I finally figured it out, I went to a meeting of Gay People's Union, which was the gay organization here in Milwaukee. It was the, the grandmother, the mother of all other things in Milwaukee. And when I walked in the room, I knew exactly what I was. I, it was like, as, as if I had been blind and suddenly I could see. I don't know how to describe it any other way. I felt as if a great weight had been taken off my shoulders. I came out with a benefit of a lover. I did not have one, um, but it's just, I knew. It wasn't right. a choice, I knew. Do you understand what I mean? Absolutely, yeah, you just, and I can't imagine like that kind of weight just lifting off of you, having to look something up and, and see the word deviant and, you yeah. know, and then finding your people, finding people who are like you and, and it was yeah. so wonderful that back then because it was the LGB community and we pretty much worked together. I mean, did the men and women disagree sometimes? Yes, they did. But pretty much we were united in fighting oppression. I mean, we had police chief Harold Pryor at the time who would have his police officers raid gay bars and beat the crap out of some, some, some gay fellows and do damage and everything else. I mean, I, he had, red folders on everyone, including me, which I think is hilarious. Um, we were called, I was called a pinko commie fag. Um, I don't know about pinko, never been a communist, and unless the army issued me something, I'm not a faggot either. Uh, and it, I mean, we worked together and, and, and we affected change. We had, we started Pride Fest. We knew if we did not stand up and protest and speak out and be public that nothing would change. The fact that we have gay marriage, the fact that we have so many things now, although we're also losing things, is right. to, to the people like me and those early activists who we were snowplow drivers. We plowed the way for the rest of you. Right. And I, I really appreciate that. That's why I'm so interested in doing this legacy series and talking to everybody. Tell me a little bit about your involvement in, in starting Pride. Um, where were you and how Milwaukee. how were you involved in Milwaukee? Yeah, well, I, I, I was president and on the board of directors of GPU and Pride initially was in Juno Park. Uh, it's a smaller park, it was a very small event. What year was this? 
Oh gosh, I'm trying to think. Um, I know Stonewall was 1969, perhaps. Right? Yeah, maybe, maybe 1980. And we did it in Juno Park because that's where all the tea rooms were. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean by tea rooms? No. <laughs> that's if you were looking for rough trade or glory holes do you know what i mean now i do yeah <laughs> okay back in the day and probably even so still today men who were afraid of being out in public or whatever would go to public bathrooms and they would seek out somebody else and they had a whole code of things that they would do so we did it in juno park because it was notorious for gay men um, cruising mm -hmm. okay. uh, and it went on from there and it's it became a really big deal it ended up down at henry meyer festival park and we even had our own fireworks for a while and before that was pride primarily taking place just in new york city the the marches or it was before it wasn't of course known as a pride march it was a gay liberation movement Yes. and it was very political in its roots um so this was the first one to take place where you were from or yeah uh i i don't recall anything like that happening we we had a parade we had music we had some food and it got bigger and bigger each year and and it was wonderful it was absolutely wonderful and it was a community that worked together to put things together and there wasn't any of this dissension Right now, you're saying that it's it's well, different for you. The LGB community. There wasn't right. any uh, LGBTQAI plus plus X Y Z. Right. But, Even when I was in school, it was the gay, gay lesbian bisexual union. And my wife um, over in California, I was in New York, um, had a gay straight alliance. So even then there wasn't this sort of tagging on of so many different letters in the alphabet um and it and it just changed uh, yeah, well, it, it, upon the new millennium now you know lgbtq ai plus plus right it, what's left nothing that includes everybody there's like 20 letters and even straight people father included me. Straight people are included now, and they're they're using the um, the word queer. I was actually talking to Ellen Broidy about this recently, which I find blatantly offensive. Merely because you have pink or blue hair and wear torn jeans doesn't mean you're queer. And it's not gay Nobody people better claiming it. Or call me queer because I'm not either of those things. I am a lesbian. Right. And it, it's one thing to reclaim something for yourself, for the group that it was used to oppress, like the word dyke being reclaimed by lesbians as a powerful uh, movement because it was used to oppress a certain group of people. But once people who are not, um, weren't called by those slurs are, are reclaiming these words, it's kind of like, this isn't yours to reclaim. And there are rules about this and everyone knows that. But for some reason, as this umbrella expands, those rules that, that society kind of goes by, that you could reclaim a slur as long as you're the group that it would have been used against, have just gone out the window. Absolutely. It, it, the analogy that I would use is, I, I get very irritated when, when some person who has an unusual haircut or whatever, or it says they're non-binary, whatever that means, uh, says, oh, I'm queer. I, that would be like if I used the N word it's it's not certainly not open to anybody to use that slur to refer to themselves tell me about um 2016 you were supposed to do an event um this is around the time i wrote about you in huffington post because uh, i wanted people to know about who you are and that you're a lesbian shiro and that we don't have don't ask don't tell anymore and if they want to thank somebody they can come knock on your door and thank you for that I was really so disturbed in 2016 when I saw that you were not even told that you were no longer speaking at this Pride Parade event. Yeah, men. If the, the, the Pride Parade Committee was, insofar as I know, and if this is not correct, 
I will, and somebody can show me, then I will stand up and say I was wrong and apologize. They, they just didn't want to deal with it. You know, they, they want to go around with their little things and, and stuff like that, but they didn't have the courage of their convictions. You know, and I had no idea initially what they were talking about because I, I didn't know that the dragon had been a male who identified as trans. And this was someone who actually at the time preferred the pronoun it. That is correct. Okay. So that, was, that was a peak. And then... And you didn't know that. You just knew that this was a person who identified as a dragon and preferred to be called it. And for this reason, you were called... Because, because you made a comment about it, you yeah. were called transphobic and pulled from the lineup of speakers, which I thought is just such a disrespectful way to treat somebody who... Um, you know, a, a lesbian who we owe so much to for changing our rights as we know them today. Well, you know, I've had people say, oh, you damaged your legacy by, you know, being, uh, taking, dissenting with trans ideology and practice. And you know what? If my legacy is dependent upon my lying and... Which it's not, of course. Mis mis engaging in misinformation and being dishonest with myself and purporting to believe in something which I know I do not believe in, that opens up the door for all kinds of wrongdoing that I don't even want to think about. If my legacy is dependent on my doing all of those negative things, then my legacy isn't worth very much, is it? Well, it's not dependent on that and certainly not to the lesbian community. And, you know, there was pushback, of course, from the lesbian community, myself included, um, to say this is e extremely disrespectful to treat uh, someone who you owe so much gratitude to in this way to pull her from the lineup but not even let her know that she's been pulled up pulled from the lineup over over something that you didn't even realize um, yeah, what, they what they were getting at at the time yeah they cashiered me also because of the words of other people right you know? I've known any number of, of trans people throughout my life, and frankly, they can live as they want. I really don't care if the guy wants to wear a dress or whatever, fine. Go for it. Absolutely. No one should be told what to wear. Language or to lie. Well, there is there is an issue of um, forcing speech, compelled speech, forcing people to use language, which doesn't really follow the right to freedom of speech and we are seeing like legal changes that would enforce compulsory language use so i think at some point this particularly where it comes to um the kind of pro-child abuse culture that's being pushed right now to um allow for the medical assault of gay and lesbian children i don't think it's going to age well people are going to look back at some point and go oh my god what were we what were we thinking? I dare say that in 25 years, the society is going to be dealing with a larger number of people who were for, you know, who were convinced they were born in the wrong body and who took artificial hormones and who are therefore be subject to a, a vast variety of very bad health problems. Um, I suggested 30 years, people are going to wonder what the insanity was to this, this, societal virus that seems to be infecting so many walks of life right now. I, I mean, I have asked people, do you really believe in your heart of hearts that this man right here is a woman? Do you know none of them will answer me? Being allowed to ask those kinds of questions, it's part of free, not just free speech, but also the right for women to be able to process reality realistically. I want to talk to you a little bit about what you've been up to lately. Well, in 2017, I went over to Spain and addressed a uh, gender conference in Madrid, which was really a lot of fun because um, the people who put on that conference told me directly that the trans community there decided they weren't going to do anything because they were afraid I was going to do something. Why, damn right, I'd have done something. 
people are afraid that you're going to do something. So this is where I get a little lost. And I have in my in my tagline on on Twitter, I've seen bombs and war. Tell me all about your triggers because it feels like everyone is just so overly scared and sensitive. You're you're coming from a generation that had a reason to be so scared, you know. And we weren't. And well, you just went. 19, 1968. My generation was a generation of change, of protest, um, of civil rights marches. Um, my generation understood very well the need for, for change. This right. generation, and I don't refer to everybody in this generation, seems to me to be a bunch of milk toasts, if you don't mind my saying so. They, they get triggered if somebody says a word. They get all upset if I say the word vagina or, or clitoris or I am a woman, um, you know, you're a man, you know, please stop. It, it, it's like, my God, they dither, okay? And it, it's like, it's because they've, they've never really had to deal with reality, you know? Right. They don't know. This, is a, this younger generation, many, many, many of them, you know, they get awards for participating. They get an award, a participation trophy. Right. You have to, you know, they, they, they've been given entitlement and they haven't earned any of it. And it, right. But every now and again, I meet a young person like you or somebody else who gives me hope and I believe. What is needed is to stop being nice. They right. were afraid I would do something because I would have. I would have gone out there and said, who the hell do you think you are? You want to you want to mess? Bring it on. I've been threatened. I, I had you know one one of these males tell me to go back into the uh, gas chamber where I belong. You know that, the anti-Semitism that's come out of this is horrific. Yeah, and I've said to some of them, you know, you, you want to do this? You know, you say you want to do this to me? Tell me when. Tell me where. Any place, any time. You and me. Oh well, I'll come and I'll bring it. I said, no, no. Don't bring your friends because I don't have an argument with them. My argument was with you. You say you want to do this? Here I am. Tell you where. Not a single one of them has ever taken me up on it. Not one. Yeah, the <laughs> threats that are have yeah, been these threats. Right. If you're gonna hurt somebody, you're not gonna go and put it on on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram. The trans or community decided not to picket or demonstrate against the gender conference because they were afraid I would do something. Yeah. And I thought, well, there's a power of being uppity and being outspoken and being out front and outrageous. You right, know? and historically, dykes aren't known for being nice. We're, 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 boom. We're, we're known for flipping off the patriarchy. We're known for um, telling it like it is. And if you don't like it, and if it, it hurts your feelings, or if it makes you feel sad, you know, I guess do what you're doing now, which is call the authorities and say that the words, the words that have been used have hurt your feelings and that you think someone deserves the absolute worst for it. Um, because that's, it's what it's boiled down to. Yeah. I, I, I oftentimes wonder if they want cheese with their wine. I think it's also, it's this expansion of the alphabet. So you don't even really know who it is that you are, that is pushing back and you know who now the the umbrella of of t has expanded to include just about anybody same as same as they're expanding the umbrella of the word lesbian to mean absolutely anybody who says that they are you've got a dyke march um being run by by not lesbians and that dyke march is being anti-semitic i don't know if you know about this the Sh <laughs> chicago dyke march so now lesbians are being told, you're not welcome. Jewish people are being told, um, you're not welcome. Gretchen, I can't remember the last name, um, a reporter, journalist covered this, um, who, by the way, is trans and was like, this is not right. This is not okay, this anti-Semitism. And got in a whole lot of hot water for, for saying that, for saying this isn't okay. Um, and there were consequences to standing up and against the, even the anti-Semitism. Well, see, that's the problem. 
it's one person here, one person there, one person here, one person there. What really needs to be done is we need to start cooperating with anybody who will work with us on this issue. I mean, I work with conservatives on this issue. I know full well they may be against gay marriage, they may be against abortion, but we aren't talking about that. We are talking about what is happening to children and women in this society and, and the butchery that's going on. And one of the things I talk to these people about is, as a Jew, I look at what's going on and this lopping off of healthy body parts. It feels to me like it's Joseph Mengele come back to haunt us, that this is crooked medicine, that this is Auschwitz medicine. And so their mind is opened up a little bit and they no longer see me as a menace, but they see right. me as a human being fighting for the rights of children to right. be children, to, right. be women, to be women, that I'm not interested in who they are intimate with but that they have a right to live and be. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, what's, it's shocking to me with so many young detransitioners coming forward that you have the main organizations, which have of course been hijacked um, by extremists like glad um, like saying, Hey, don't pay attention to these detransitioners and, you know, really coming down on 60 minutes, for example, who, allowed detransitioners a chance to tell their story and say, hey, we shouldn't be doing this to children um, and young people. And just saying, don't pay attention to that, please. Don't look behind the curtain because they know the NCLR is, it's an organization that's, again, not run by lesbians anymore. It's, it's completely gone against the lesbian community and come up against a lot of controversy with, with the lesbian community. And now they're pushing for Arizona to, you know, cover the medical expenses of children who want double mastectomies. And anyone I've come into contact with in real life who I've explained, you know, we don't reach full cognitive brain development until the age of 25. And this is dangerous. And statistically speaking, most of these kids would otherwise grow up to be gay and lesbian adults. So this is uh, gay conversion therapy. Not a single one of them has been like, you know, oh, let's, let's do it anyway. It's medical assault. So nobody should be scared of you. Um, what they should be scared of is what's happening. I, thought I, would, I would do something uppity or confrontational. And my answer is, hell yeah, I would have. The, the people who put on the conference were glad to have me because I kept the protesters away. Um, what really needs to be done is, if there are a million women, say for example, or a million people in the United States, each one of those persons needs to get one dollar bill out of their wallet or their pocket or whatever, and there needs to be established a defense fund. So if a person is silenced or canceled for no good reason whatsoever, and their freedom of speech is abridged, to the extent that it's being abridged now, that they can go and access some of this money, get a good attorney, and fight it in court because I think that's where it's gonna it's gonna win. And one of the things when they go to court is they need to talk about not transgender, but the fact that women experience discrimination and oppression because of their biology. Right. I mean, I have never been discriminated against because of my gender. But I certainly have experienced discrimination because of my biology, because of my sex. Yeah. And I think people need to start doing that. I think when there's enough people who are going to stand up and fight back um, and it starts hurting them in the pocketbooks, they're going to take a step back or two. We also need to stop being nice. We need to get uppity. You know, if, if a, a woman loses her job, we need to be there to support her and right. raise holy hell about it. Being nice, being silent, you know, saying, oh, well, you know, let's have a civil dialogue isn't going to work because you are dealing with, the analogy I would use is that you're dealing with barbarians. And what we need to do is recognize and learn the language that the barbarians use because that way we will understand how they think and we will be able to use that language to, to point out 
the, um, the falsehood of their ways. We're outnumbered in this alphabet now. So we've gone from being a minority in a group with another minority. So, you know, as you start adding on letters, now we're really a minority within a majority. Absolutely. And, and I think, and that's why I will work with anybody. I, I took seriously Lisa Vogel's idea of planting acorns, you know, after the Michigan Women's Music Festival. Mm -hmm. which is why I will work with conservative women and I help co-found Hands Across the Aisle Women in Coalition with an evangelical Christian woman. Oh, wow. Because we found we had a lot more in common than we had in terms of difference. Mm -hmm. Knowing each other's difference meant we could work on the issues where we had common ground. And Hands Across the Aisle has been very successful in that regard. I, I believe in planting acorns. I believe in education. The fact that I've addressed um, Christian groups and had you know, pastors ask, ask me to, to uh, do like a podcast for their church speaks well of them. It means they're getting education. And it, it's very interesting. You can't change anything unless you're willing to work together. Not once have they ever been insulting towards me or nasty towards me, but I sure to, I sure the heck get it from the, the wokey folkies of the left, you know? Um, oh, you're this, you're that. Well, you know, conservative women are women and they understand oppression and they understand discrimination. Conservative women are mothers, are somebody's daughters, are somebody's sister, are somebody's aunt, are somebody's cousin, and they understand this. And that's this is how this is going to end is when we stop fighting with one another and just say, look, we know we won't agree on this, but we have a lot of common ground here. Let's work on this. And the right and the left have a lot more in common right now than I think a lot of people realize. Far left, you bet. Right. The far right extremists and the far left extremists. I mean, they, they should be best friends at this point because they've just gone so far off the deep end that they've just met right, right in the middle together. I don't really understand when people say to me, well, I won't talk to um, or deal with conservative people. Well, then you're going to be in limbo. Things are going to just stay in limbo and no one's ever going to get anywhere. Well, it's the conservative people that are helping us out right now because I get published in conservative publications um, I'm thinking of working on a, on a paper, a piece right now that it's something that's been fermenting in my head for quite a while. And there is no left publication that will publish me or give me a fair and safe platform to present my case. And for anyone watching who thinks that, oh, this isn't true, this, you know, it's absolutely true. The left has been censoring, um, you know, I wrote an article called Co-opting the L, Homophobia and the Thought Police, and I published it. It was, it was promoted on Huffington Post, um, and then some extremists complained about it, and it was demoted. And that's also why we started the Velvet Chronicle, because young detransitioners wanted a place to... Um, speak and nobody on the left would let them tell their stories and we finally had a, a young lesbian friend of ours who was trying to just tell her story about what happened and how she got sucked into this as a kid and nobody would publish it. I'm an independent, I'm left of center and I just feel like I don't have a home. A lot of, I think a, so many lesbians feel that way and, and just you know a lot of women in general um, are feeling that way because our rights aren't being protected. Our, you know, we've become a minority in the groups that were once set up to protect us. We've even been kicked out of groups like NCLR, the National Center for Lesbian Rights. We've been kicked out. And, um, you know, they're retelling history in a, in a way that is completely inaccurate. They are downplaying or not mentioning at all, and this is something lesbians have had a big problem with and have talked to um, NCLR about, Stormy being the uh, catalyst for Stonewall. Yes. And, and throwing the first punch at Stonewall. And, and they're actually crediting anybody but Stormy. <laughs> Males identifying as trans for being the catalyst, the lambdas of this the Stonewall Rebellion. Stormy only recently passed away, so it's kind of like 
if you think you're going to revise this person post-mortem and that this community is not going to say anything about it, you got another thing coming. I know. It angers me. Yeah, and it makes you say to yourself, what are they going to say about me when I'm not here? You know, if, if I myself or my wife is, is uh, non-conforming to expectations that are put upon females, then what will, what will be said? Well, nobody's 100% gender conforming. You know, right. it's ridiculous. And the thing of it is, is I, I do, I just wish that more people would stand up and band together. You know, it's, it's, if every person who really felt the way you feel, the way I feel, and I, there are a lot of them out there, could just somehow or another stand up and, and you know, there's this, this the alt-right, the alt-left, and then there's this whole, you know, bunch of us that are stuck in the middle again. Right. <laughs> to use a line from a song. Uh, you know, there has to be a way to start educating these people, making sure they learn. And I don't know exactly how to do it because I don't have a booking agent right. or anything like that. But it's time now for us to go to PBS, which had a whole thing about trans ideology and trans practice and, you know, all this stuff. To say, look, you need to present both sides of this, you know. And we need to be going to, to major media and saying, if you do this, that's all right, fine. But you need to present the fair and balanced other side of the coin as well. And we need to, you know, not be nice about it and say, oh, please, will you do this? And we need to go and say, we have people who can do this. We have fact. We have research. And, and we'd like to present this. And you better do it. And on that note, um, I'm going to just ask about what your latest project is, and then we will call this one for the day and maybe do a follow-up at some point because I could just talk to you for a very long time about what you did and what you accomplished and um, so much to talk about. But what is the latest project? Well, I'm thinking about an article that I want to write. A number of years ago, PBS had um, a series called The Dictator's Playbook. And they took a look at like Stalin, Mussolini, Franco, Hitler, Pol Pot, um, and how do dictators go about getting the power that they have? And in the midst of watching this series, it was sort of like, gee, this sounds awfully familiar. And so I started taking notes. And I want to I wanna compare the, the, the things that dictators do to get the power they have with what big pharma, big medicine, and and tra and the trans juggernaut is doing. It's very it's very like what Hitler and Mussolini and, and Franco and others did to get power. Um, misinformation, uh, straw man arguments all over. It really it, it it's something I think that needs to be said. And I'd like to, I, I'm not a medical person. I, I, I was a, a teacher of the English language for 37 years, but I'd like to write about the barbarism that I see that's going on in the medical community now. I mean, this is vivisection almost, mm -hmm. that they do these young women. It's, it's whatever happened to first do no harm. Right. I, I, I wait. Do no harm. What what happened to that? Like what happened to the protocol that existed in the medical community, where we knew about we know about cognitive brain development. We know that the prefrontal cortex doesn't develop until after 25. The part of the brain which is concerned with identity, understanding long-term repercussions understanding consequences. You know, I've had parents say to me, oh, you know, they'll write to me because they have a, a daughter who's a lesbian or maybe um, has kind of fallen into gender ideology. And they'll say, oh, my kid's so smart though and so responsible. And I'll say apples and oranges. At, at 15, 16 years old, 
I was a dance teacher. I was very responsible and I could have told, talked the Pope into believing he was Jewish. <laughs> um, but that has nothing to do with that particular part of the brain, um, which simply hasn't, has not developed yet. Um, so your kid, yes, can be absolutely very highly intelligent and well-spoken and all that good stuff, apples and oranges, but do no harm is, is, uh, just completely gone out the window when it comes to kids who, again, statistically are mostly, uh, would, would mostly grow up to be gay and lesbian otherwise. And it's, it's pretty scary what's happened. Well, it is conversion therapy. I mean, they, they use the very tactics they wish w would not be used on them, even to the point of denying talk therapy. Right. You know, um, which is illegal now a therapist to be the right to ask questions as in why do you feel this way um, can you explain to me how you came to to feel the way you do and it's just it's it's ridiculous if i didn't know better i'd, I'd say I, I don't know what to think this just reminds me so much of nazi germany mm -hmm. you know, and i'm jewish so i can say nazi right and i'm i'm part jewish so i can too <laughs> you know i mean it, it's like the excoriation that goes right. on, the fact that gender critical people are portrayed as being these horrible bigots and everything. I mean, I've been called a dangerous bigot. Well, perhaps I am. I don't know. Uh, if bigoted means I don't like lies and misinformation, then I am. And it's, 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 I, I don't, where has common sense gone? Not sure. You know, is it in the water? It took a leave? Is there something? It's easy to convince humanity of that, that the inhumane is the way to go. And we've seen this time and time again throughout history. And it's interesting that you kind of keep bringing it to um, this sort of Holocaust, Nazi. We've seen it over and over again in history that humanity can be convinced of the inhumane. And it, it is a combination of propaganda and... Um, you know, setting it to feel good music, making people bop along to it, getting those those right people in front of the camera that can sell, sell, sell an idea. And it's being sold to them by people that they feel they could trust. But what they don't realize is, is that these organizations are no longer run by, you know, the Dyke March uh, in Chicago, not run by lesbians. All of the organizations. So somebody can even say, I'm a lesbian and I'm running the Dyke March. But when lesbian means absolutely anybody who says they are, um, and we change the words and we change the definitions and we're not allowed to talk about the words changing and we're not allowed to use language anymore, then it appears to most people like the Dyke March or these organizations are being run by who's saying they're running it, but it's not. Um, now straight people can say they're queer. So who is run who's, who's in charge here? Nobody. Everybody. <laughs> Not the lesbians, that's for sure. That's for sure. You know, and yeah. maybe, maybe the lesbians need to do a lesbian march as opposed to a dark dyke march. I mean, I, I get angry because, I, you know, Palestinians want to march. That's fine with me. I don't have a problem. Why can't I march with a Star of David flag? I couldn't believe that. I, that is, it's Why do I been to so shocking to me. Pictures of, you know, a, a, a rather butch woman or something. In the, in the Dyke March, carrying anti-Semitic signs. It was a, a cartoon. Such a slap in the face. I saw that. It looks like dykes are behind it because it's being done in our name because now anyone can identify into anything. It, it doesn't, nothing means anything. So it looks like lesbians are being anti-Semitic. But I happen to know because I looked into it um, a few years ago that it's not run by it's not a lesbian run event it just seems that way so well it's been such an honor to talk to you um such an important person who gave us so much if it wasn't for women like you who stood up we wouldn't have so much of what we have now well, and in your case yeah, we wouldn't here, but for the suffragettes and, and, and women like Sojourner Truth, these were the people who taught me the value of being a woman. I mean, I, I stand on strong shoulders. I only hope my shoulders are strong enough to support the women who come after me. 
for what you went through, I, I believe they are. For the things that you have gone through. I don't think I'm a hero. I, 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 think, I think that correct action, a warrior may act as if she knew, even though she doesn't, and trusts that place inside of her to know the difference between right and wrong. It, I'm not a hero. It's just I am doing the best that I know how to try and fight a very bad wrong. We need to stop being nice. We need to start making history. Exactly. Anywhere, any place, any time that discrimination against women or, you know, the, the, the grooming of children takes place, we need to be there um, right. speaking out and, and, and being loud. I mean, I think it's interesting that, that uh, the woman at that we, the, that spa, that Korean spa, you know, that there was a big oh, altercation. Oh, goodness. Very interesting. Right. That it wasn't the, the, the women who were protesting the uh, fellow who was wagging his willy about. Um, In front of the, 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 the girls, the right. Who were, who, who were being violent. Well, you know, there are ways of dealing with that. It was very scary to see all the men get uh, ganging up, and actually, a friend of mine was at that uh, protest and was was um, violently approached for being at that protest. And I don't think a lot of people even know the real story behind what happened. Well, uh, that guy, that guy is a, is a known fetishist, right? And it and to see women being surrounded, it was this kind of like burn the witch thing. But and by mostly some women, but a lot of men, it just feels like what's really going on here. Like, do people not see the misogyny happening here? Um, this excuse that they now have to come after women in such a harsh and, and violent way and actually call it progressive and be like, Oh no, but we're being progressive. No, you're not. No. Well, it was such an honor to have you uh, to talk to you today, and um, I hope we get to do it again soon. Sure. And uh, I, my pleasure. Yeah, I have so many more questions I want to ask you at some point, <laughs> and we'll talk again soon. Is there anything you want to say in wrapping up to young lesbians or just lesbians in general who might be watching this? Um, do not lose heart. I'm on Facebook, and I can only speak for myself, but if you have any questions, you can find me on Facebook, and I will answer you with honesty and with integrity. Um, but also be aware that this is misogyny, and this is uh, a cult that's, don't buy into it. Very homophobic cult. Yeah, really. Yeah. Um, it, it will take, you, you will have to be strong. But why has that ever been difficult for women? We've been strong for, for eons. We didn't even get into how horribly the, the young lesbian community has, has been attacked and gaslighted. Well, that's, that's a, a tale for another day, but that's, that's a I, great I message. I want to say to, to the sisters who have detransitioned, I want to say personally, Welcome home. We've been waiting for you. They're a part of the lesbian community. Right. And it's important that the lesbian community remember absolutely to embrace uh, detransitioned youth. On that note, have a wonderful, wonderful night. And we will talk soon. Okay. Be well, stay safe, and say hello to the chickens. I will. <laughs> have a good one. Okay. Bye-bye.